Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Carlson. I practice law in uh, Butte, Montana, and this year I'm honored to serve as the president of the American Bar Association. This year marks the 19th annual edition of the Leon Jaworski Public Program to commemorate Law Day. We are so pleased to be here at the beautiful Knight Conference Center at the Museum in the heart of our nation's capital. Our presence here this evening is thanks to our host, program partners, the Museum and the Freedom Forum Institute. I am now pleased to introduce Gene Polozinski, the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Freedom Forum Institute. Gene. spent youth has finally come home to <laughs> come home to get me uh, uh, welcome to the night conference center thank you very much Bob and for your gracious introduction and and also uh, we want to thank the ABA for commitment to law day and for a survey on uh, civic um, engagement which was uh, discussed just briefly in a program prior to this um, we think that that is an absolutely uh, essential part of restoring respect for the rule of law and for um, our system of government. You know, the, the title today of the Jaworski program series is The Marketplace of Ideas in an Era of Fake News. And I, I trace that back to Milton and Arapagetica. And there's one line in that that I'll badly quote because I, I won't do any better than I did when I was in college. Uh, but essentially it's who knows, knows truth to be worse for the fight with falsehood. And I think that's the fundamental principle of the marketplace of ideas. The founders had an essential belief that if we simply talk to each other in a civil manner, and that didn't
So thanks, Lucian, appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about the answers to those questions. A uh, word from our sponsors. We are pleased to partner with the Federation of State Humanities Council and the ABA Division for Public Education is also happy to welcome two other ABA groups as our 2019 program partners, the Civil Rights and Social Justice Section and the Forum on Communications Law. We are pleased to partner this year again with the National Constitution Center and to have Jeffrey Rosen as our program moderator. This public program series is named in honor of a great American lawyer and ABA leader Leon Jaworski. A few years before his tenure as the second Watergate Special Prosecutor, Leon Jaworski served as president of the American Bar Association. And while ABA president, he established the committee that developed into the ABA Division for Public Education. A bequest from his estate in 1983 established an endowed ABA fund in his name. This endowment, the Leon Jaworski Fund for Public Education, continues to support ABA public programs, including ours here this evening, which are dedicated to advancing public understanding of law and its role in society. Now to begin our panel discussion. I'm very pleased to introduce our program moderator, Jeffrey Rosen. Jeff has been president and chief executive officer of the National Constitution <laughs> Center since 2013. The center is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate the public about the U.S. Constitution. Jeff is also a professor at George Washington University Law School and a contributing editor of The Atlantic. He is the author of six books, including most recently, Louis Brandeis, American Prophet, and William Howard Taft, also I believe a former ABA president, uh, the 27th president. His essays and commentaries have appeared in The Atlantic, the New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, and The New Yorker, as well as on NPR. This is his third ABA Leon Jaworski public program for Law Day that Jeff is modeling. first three words of the Constitution. It was the cheeriest civic poll that I've ever <laughs> encountered. Uh, we are going to spread some remarkable light about the First Amendment in this concentrated period. You have before you the dream team of thinkers about the First Amendment in America. It is impossible to imagine four people better equipped to answer the questions that you have set for us, namely, does Holmes's metaphor of the marketplace of ideas still apply in the era of the internet and fake news? And if not, what is the best alternative? You know the questions, so you've had a chance to think about them. My job, I just get to have the pleasure of reading from Abrams. Uh, so why don't we all, members of the congregation, turn to <laughs> page 12, I think, of the program book, which Howard Kaplan has so beautifully put together. And he's so well selected these inspiring quotations about free speech. And here it is, and I, because I'm the moderator, I get to do the reading, but you can read along out loud with me or silently as you please uh, during this portion of the Minion. And uh, <clears throat> this is from Holmes in Abrams. But when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in a competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. Every year, if not every day, we have to wager our salvation upon some prophecy based on imperfect knowledge. While that experiment is part of our system, I think 
that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so imminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. Wow, that is constitutional poetry. It is such a privilege <laughs> to read those beautiful words of Holmes. And now, Nicole, you have administered free speech for Google. You've been the Supreme, uh, the, the Chief Justice for the world in your role as the decider <laughs> of free speech for Google. Do you believe in the age of the internet that Holmes's metaphor of the marketplace of ideas is still relevant or not? Uh, so, thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the ABA for hosting this really important forum. Um, I love the notion that we're trying to continue to educate uh, the country about what the Constitution means to us. Um, in terms of the marketplace, is it still relevant today? I believe so. Um, I also believe that we, and in particular, the tech companies who are the global platform for much of our speech have an obligation to be thinking about how we create a fair marketplace um, for, for everyone. And, and I, right now, flexibly, let me say, I think in the beginning, if you think 20 years ago, to me, the reason I got involved in the internet is because I really believed this would be the most democratized communication platform we have ever had in human history. And I still believe that that is possible. Um, but it takes work every day with every product, with every feature, with every business model to commit to that. Um, and I feel like some of the tech companies, and particularly the large players, have created platforms that runs to some of our worst instincts and our greatest excesses. And in that landscape, the marketplace is distorted. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Frederick Schauer, you have been among America's most prominent critics of the metaphor of the marketplace <laughs> of ideas. Is this time for a big, I told you so? <laughs> and what in particular do you think is flawed about the metaphor in light of the internet? I told you so is probably stating it a little bit too strongly, but um, as a professional pedant, uh, let me draw a distinction uh, that comes out of Holmes's uh, language. If we think about the idea of the best test of truth, one way to understand that is that the marketplace of ideas is a way to determine what truth is. Holmes probably believed that. Holmes was a pragmatist, Holmes was a skeptic, probably believed that whatever it is that the marketplace of ideas generates and produces is by definition true. There's something very democratic about that, uh, it especially when we think about questions of social policy or political truth. Maybe what Holmes was talking about was democracy itself. Um, I'm not a skeptic of that. The other side of this distinction, though, is suppose, like John Stuart Mill, you believe that there is some notion of truth independent of what the marketplace happens to generate. And if there's a notion of truth independent of or prior to what the market generates, then the question is, how good is the market at identifying this antecedently defined truth? Here, although Milton was a poet and Mill was a philosopher and Holmes was a lawyer, here the question is actually a question of social science. Uh, that is, to what extent is open interchange of ideas a particularly good method for identifying what is true and what's false? A great deal of social science evidence, much of it generated in the last couple of decades, says not much or not very. Um, that if we rephrase the question, and I'll end with this, what, if we think about a marketplace of anything, whether it be soap or clothing uh, or breakfast cereal or whatever, if we think of uh, the marketplace as a way of evaluating different contributions, 
then one, one thing we might want to think about, or one way we might want to put this, is what is the explanatory power of the truth of an idea in determining which ideas will be accepted and which will not? Compared to who is saying it, what are the antecedent beliefs of the audience, what turns on accepting or rejecting it, what kinds of psychological flaws might audiences as a matter of group psychology have, and so on. And one of the unfortunately depressing conclusions of a lot of modern empirical research on this is that the truth of a proposition has a little bit of explanatory power in determining which propositions will be accepted and not, but not nearly as much as a lot of others. And if we think just about issues of climate change and vaccination to be contemporary about all of this, it's little cause for optimism. Thank you for that. Okay, we've got two pessimistic <laughs> beginning interventions. <laughs> One questioning the, value, the virtues of the tech companies in promoting the marketplace of ideas, and another questioning empirically whether what the crowd wants, which actually will produce the truth. Dahlia Lithwick, in your pathbreaking and always illuminating commentary about free speech and other questions, you recently wrote a piece, Living in Charlottesville, about being in Charlottesville and thinking about breaking up with the First Amendment after seeing those white nationalists face to face. Tell us more about that experience and whether it convinced you that the marketplace metaphor is or is not still relevant. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, for having me. Thanks to the ABA for hosting this. Um, and no, you ain't seen pessimism yet, <laughs> but, but just hold on. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things that uh, I struggle with, uh, with this marketplace formulation, is that it presupposes some very quaint uh, forms of communication, one of which is some kind of face-to-face -face communication, some kind of accidental brushing up against an idea that is not necessarily confirming your own biases. And that's, I think, simply gone for some of the reasons uh, that market monopolies uh, have really, you know, that this notion of the daily me, you can get up in the morning and spend your whole day reading and never encounter an idea that does not reconfirm what your biases were. And I think that part of losing that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction is that you, there, there's no possibility of that happening anymore. So I, I think that's one of the things that I've seen happen. And I think when you talk about incitement, that's also problematic now because of new media. Uh, but I think you know the other thing that I would say, again, having lived, uh, uh, and Fred did too, through, through uh, Charlottesville Nazis, was that you, know, you can say Skokie, 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 Skokie as your frame, which is what those of us who had thought about the First Amendment prior to Charlottesville said um, over the entire summer, by the way, that included not one but three Nazi marches and one Klan march uh, for, for good measure. Uh, but Skokie in, in no way, I think, protected against what happens when the internet is being used to organize people coming armed to. That's not a speech problem anymore. That's an internet problem and a Second Amendment problem that all got kind of uh, smushed into a very narrow aperture that was a speech aperture. And so I think, you know, as the world uh, uh, gets big and as the marketplace is controlled by monopolies and as we lose the possibility of encountering an idea that is different from our own ideas, uh, I think that what you know I saw happen in Charlottesville had nothing to do with uh, marketplace or ideas. It just had to do with using new media to radicalize people and then use First Amendment frames to justify what had happened. And I think I would just close um, with this, and I, I think it dovetails with what Fred just said. Um, at, at some point, the marketplace of ideas has to have a predicate belief that someone is going to be the arbiter of what is true. And I think that we're now enmeshed in a sort of international, global fight about hot potatoing that role to someone else. Nobody, Twitter does not want to be the arbiter of what is true. Mm. Facebook doesn't want to be the arbiter of what is true. Certainly news media does not want to be the arbiter of what is true. And so what I think you're seeing is this kind of funny tragedy of everybody agreeing that truth has fallen out 
from the marketplace of idea, but nobody wanting to be the person that determines what truth is. Thank you for calling our attention to the importance of face-to-face -face deliberation for identifying truth, for noting that new media can bring people together but then not have ideas spread, and also the decline of trusted intermediaries for adjudicating the truth. Um, Floyd Abrams, you argued the Pentagon Papers case. You told me that in arguing that and other cases, the judges noted that everyone trusts the New York Times. Tell us about that, the new decline in trust in institutions like the Times, and what you think that says about the relevance of the marketplace metaphor. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've thought for some time about the very first moment of the Pentagon Papers case uh, which I didn't argue, but I'm glad to take the credit for it. <laughs> but, but, sure. but, uh, but I was there. You're there. Uh, uh, um, we were called in to meet a new federal judge. He had been sworn in the day before. The Pentagon Papers case was his first case. Lucky man. <laughs> uh, uh, one of his colleagues sworn in the next day told me once, that every night when he goes to sleep, he thanks God he didn't get the <laughs> Pentagon Papers case as his first case. Um, but the first thing that Judge Gerfein said to us, and remember when this all occurred, the war in Vietnam was on, uh, the document at issue <coughs> was one Secretary of Defense McNamara had asked to be prepared, a sort of a study how we got into Vietnam. Put aside, you know, one, one would like to think they might do a study before uh, we get in, but, but the war was on, going badly. No one could think of a, a way out we were prepared to take in terms of what weapons we were prepared to use uh, and the like. So this secret, top secret designated, uh, uh, 23 volume, a collection of Defense Department documents, all of them classified, and most of them at, at the, what was purportedly at least the highest level of classification, uh, top secret, uh, was put together. How we got into Vietnam, um, and sort of a little bit of where we were. Uh, but the Pentagon Papers case was 1971. The Pentagon Papers ended in 1968. So there, there was a, a gap there. What was the first thing this brand new district court judge said to us in a case during warfare where there were American POWs being held in which it seemed to be, turned out to be, interminable? He said, we're all Americans. This was off the record, in chambers. We're all Americans here. We all want to do the right thing. Uh, and he meant it, and everybody believed that he meant it and that it was true. Um, um, and from there, uh, and I believe then and now, <coughs> that based in part on his view, and ultimately that, at least of a majority of the Supreme Court, that they were prepared to take the risks and let me be clear, a majority of the Supreme Court, in their opinions, said that it would be harmful to publish all of the Pentagon Papers, which the Times didn't do anyway, but, but the court couldn't know that. The liberal justices, the First Amendment justices on the court, all said in one way or another, you know, we really think this is very dangerous stuff, and we're, we, we think there, there may be real harm, but, and the but was the government couldn't demonstrate uh, by sufficient evidence, with sufficient clarity, uh, that the harm would occur and that it would be grave enough to justify the entry uh, of a prior restraint. <coughs> and so the, the, the observation I was making earlier was that our new world, our new internet world, with all the new issues uh, that arise 
because of mass communications, the enormous expansion of democratic, small d, big time, democratic speech, free speech for all allowed uh, and, and very difficult for even repressive countries to really ban the whole thing. I mean, a new world in that sense. But, uh, but that one of the other realities is that Julian Assange is not American, uh, is not pro-American, uh, is quite willing to do things without the slightest concern that will, it will harm American national security. And so when cases come up, when his case, uh, particularly if it's expanded, comes up uh, in the courts, no judge is going to be uh, starting with the notion everyone's acting in good faith, we're all on the same team, we just happen to disagree uh, about uh, the different value of publication vis-a-vis -vis potential harm. Um, and that's something that I think will <coughs> affect uh, ultimate uh, juridical decision making. The other side of that is that in almost a, a wholly unpredictable way, we've come to a point uh, in our uh, law, our First Amendment law, when liberals and conservatives, for their own reasons and with their own backgrounds and bringing very different sorts of uh, uh, overviews, uh, have come to make this, I would argue, the most, but in any event, one of the most uh, First Amendment protective Supreme Courts uh, in our history. Uh, John Roberts was quoted as saying just a few months ago, uh, Adam Liptak wrote about this in the New York Times, that, uh, that he was the most First Amendment oriented of anyone on the court. Uh, uh, I think others on the court would, would opt for that position. Uh, and, and some of the cases which are decided by eight to one votes of terrible speech. I mean, when I was in law school, just to give one example, when I was in law school, if we had had a case, if the, our, our country had had a case uh, involving uh, a, a self-described church which showed up in front of funeral homes and churches to denounce our dead soldiers uh, and to do it in the name of God is rightly punishing us because we're too soft on homosexuals, which is the Supreme Court Snyder case of a few years ago, that Justice Black wouldn't have voted, in my view to sustain that sort of, he would, he would have found a way to say that's not speech. Um, and, and yet, I mean, here we have horrible, deeply offensive, wounding speech, case brought by the father of one of the um, uh, killed soldiers, uh, which he'd won below on grounds of intentional injury, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do personal injury. Um, they're all on board, um, and more. Justice, Justice, the Chief Justice writes an opinion saying we give a special protection to this speech, not just ordinary protection, more than ordinary First Amendment protection, because this is speech about a public policy issue, the role of gays in American life, the role of homosexuals in the army, there are lots of ways, you know, he used uh, both of those. So at one and the same time, it seems to me, we're at a moment uh, uh, in which the, the sort of, uh, you could say self-righteous, or I, I would defend it more than that, but, but the sort of overview of we're all Americans, we're trying to do the right thing, with difficult situations, especially where national security is involved against some sort of right, right, right to print or right to speak. 
that, that as that collapses, uh, there grows this, this fortress of First Amendment protection in one very disagreeable fact case mm -hmm. after another. Movies of dogs and cats <laughs> being stepped on by women with stiletto heels and dying uh, uh, protected. But, but, but don't you understand? That's the First Amendment. Uh, at least the court said it was an overbreath case. But nonetheless, they protected that speech. I don't think any Supreme Court back 50 years ago, and I remember 2006, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, good times, uh, good times. Would have, would have quite so easily come along and, and said, well, you know, it's the First Amendment. We have to protect it. Thank you for identifying this fascinating tension between the embrace of the First Amendment tradition by liberal and conservative justices of the Supreme Court and deep skepticism of it by members of this panel and by overwhelming consumer and political pressures around the globe. I have to tell you, friends, I'm struck by the significance of this panel and by the urgent need for us to hear their views about what the alternative to the marketplace metaphor might be, given their skepticism of it. And I need in this round to introduce the second part of Holmes's test. He said that because the best test of truth is the power to be accepted in the marketplace of ideas, therefore, speech should only be banned if an idea so imminently threatens immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that immediate check is required. And of course, Justice Brandeis, in the Whitney opinion, stated that even more succinctly in declaring that only speech could be banned when it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. And that standard was codified in the Brandenburg case, which also turns 50 uh, this year, if my math yes. is right. Yes. 50 yes. years old. Okay. So, Nicole, you have, uh, you just told me something fascinating, which is that you are skeptical about whether the imminence test is still relevant in a world of bots, when bots can suffuse speech at a volume that Brandeis and Holmes never anticipated. Tell us how you think that imminence is under threat given the possibility of virtual speech and begin in this answer, because we only have a little bit of time and this is really important. <laughs> if the imminence test and the marketplace metaphor don't work, what is a solution and what can the tech companies do? Okay. This is I'm rusty on the imminence test. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, so I'll, I'll go for what I was describing, which is the, the problem of bots in the marketplace. Um, and this is a little bit of what I was talking about earlier about the distortion of the marketplace. In, in online forums these days, one of the clear problems we have in determining what is imminent, um, what, is, what is true, is the distortion caused by troll armies, people who come onto a platform to deliberately distort um, or, or to threaten or harass other users on the platform, and, and other, alternatively, to use automated bots, which are robots that actually like put out text. They're not people. They're run by machines, and they flood a marketplace. And, and the, the effect of that is to push actual users, organic conversation, off of a platform and steal the attention economy um, with their own distorted truths <clears throat> or, or, or uh, other content. Um, to me, that is the biggest threat, which is that we can't rely on a marketplace unless we get some sort of handle on controlling those forces. Um, I believe that that is possible and that, is, that it is technically possible. Um, it is, in some cases, very difficult. <coughs> um, and, and I think one of the things, there was an article recently by uh, Professor Kate Klonick. Um, she wrote in The New Yorker an accounting of how Facebook handled the live stream um, Christchurch shooting and what they had to do in order to identify it, understand it, isolate it so that it didn't spread, and then make sure that it didn't get <coughs> back. Um, and I, I think that, like determining in that really fraught environment what is real, what is not real, what the action that is appropriate should be is enormously difficult. Um, 
for, for, for lawyers, but for, but for these tech companies trying to make decisions in a very fast turnaround. But th this is a very helpful way of uh, focusing us on a solution. If the problem is bots, you're telling us, then the companies could treat bot speech differently than yeah. real speech. If we can identify them accurately, yes. A and you think they might be able to do so? They should. But can, can I interject with just no, well, I want to go in turn, because this, oh. <laughs> this is very important. We, okay. Everyone come up with their uh, uh, solution. Um, but, but, but Floyd, do you have a small intervention? I, I don't I do. the spirit of the First I Amendment, then. <laughs> but, uh, okay. I, I had one line. Oh, go ahead. I saw a headline today, which I'd never seen before. A headline in today's afternoon New York Times was that President Trump spoke accurately when he said <laughs> that blank firemen had written to him uh, and supported him that it wasn't bots which had been rumored online, but that he really had received, in fact, in truth, which was a, a certain amount of letters <laughs> supporting his position, and that that was newsworthy. Mm -hmm. And an excellent <laughs> example of how we can, in fact, distinguish between bot speech and fake speech. Fred, is your objection uh, both to the marketplace metaphor and to the imminence test? After all, Brandeis came up with the imminence test not because he thought that good ideas would crush bad ones, but because he had faith in the power of deliberation. It was a much more Periclean vision. And if you, if you don't like the imminence test as well as the marketplace metaphor, can you please offer us an so, alternative? Imminence to me, if we are in the realm of, broadly speaking, political, social, ideological speech, is the right test. I think Brandenburg was right. Ah. Uh, my concern um, is that what we are seeing these days is an attempt to apply that to almost the full range of linguistic conduct uh, or linguistic behavior. When Justice Kagan, in a very recent Supreme Court case, chastised the majority, she was in dissent, for weaponizing the First Amendment. What she was really talking about was the use of the First Amendment as a broad-based, libertarian, deregulatory tool, uh, economic deregulation. Uh, and that's what she objected to. So when, we, when you ask me, what's the alternative? I think part of it is if we divide the universe of speech, however roughly this may be, into broadly speaking, political, social, ideological, and the like on the one hand, and other things. One alternative is if we are talking about representations about securities, the alternative is the SEC. If we are talking about the representations on drug labels, the alternative is the Food and Drug Administration. If we are talking about the representations about product quality, the alternative is the Federal Trade Commission. Mm. So um, it may be important here when we are thinking about all of this to say maybe in some areas, government as a determiner of truth or not, as with the SEC, the FDA, um, uh, the FTC, and occasionally the NLRB, at least since the 1930s, hasn't done such a bad job. Uh, the danger is in thinking that the appropriate reasons for keeping government out when we are talking about the political, the moral, the ideological, and the social carry over easily to this whole realm of um, commercial behavior, economic behavior, and so on. Very interesting. So for you, the problem is not the imminence test. It's treating commercial speech the same as political speech, and you would change the regulatory bodies. Right. And, and one of my worries is, and a worry that was articulated by Justice Powell maybe 40 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, is the dilution problem. That is, if we think that, broadly speaking, economic or commercial speech ought to be treated the same way as political, social, and ideological speech, then one risk is that we are going to dilute the Brandenburg test that we have for core political ideological speech if we want to treat it all the same. Uh, 
Dahlia, um, we have some consensus around the imminence test and questions about its application. You were in Charlottesville. That involved Nazis. Brandenburg involved Nazis, too. Do you support the imminence test for Nazis in Charlottesville or not? And if not, what, what's your alternative? Yeah, I, I don't think it was an imminence problem. I think it was, uh, uh, as I said, a, a problem of analyzing online organizing that was quite deliberately constructing uh, a plan and a program to bring guns to a rally and hurt people. And that uh, it, it, it's not an imminence problem as much as it is this needed to be analyzed as uh, not a pure speech rally problem, but as a what happens when speech is accompanied by the intention to kill people and the weapons to kill people. And I think that we were, you know, at the time hampered by a sort of backward looking notion of what speech is when it's accompanied by, you know, the force of uh, semi automatic weapons. I, I think the one other thing that I would just add to what Fred just said, because I think it's, it's critically important in this conversation, and it, it dovetails with something that Floyd said too, is just in the last few years, we've heard the Supreme Court say that campaign donations are speech and union dues are speech and the baking of a cake is speech. There's nothing that isn't speech, you know, posting uh, signs in abortion clinic. I mean, there's nothing that is not now construed as a speech problem. And I think that that solves a certain glorious American notion that everything is speech because we all just want to talk all the time and it's very you know profound and beautiful what it doesn't solve is all the sort of ancillary either the market problems uh, the imminence problems uh, I think in Charlottesville the actual violence problems of honing in on speech as somehow a greater constitutional value than anything else mm. the more you sweep into the bucket of speech the more you're eliding very real other problems. And so I think Charlottesville, to me, was a good, a really good example of that. And it's the failure, I think, of the Supreme Court to disaggregate. You know, everything that is claimed to be a speech right isn't necessarily purely a speech right. And just parenthetically, when you look at, and I have huge questions about the, the Charlottesville, the post-Charlottesville lawsuits, uh, and they're problematic in a million ways, but it is really interesting to see that the defense now being mounted by people who actually plan to kill people with cars <coughs> and linked to, you know, this is how you might run someone over with the car and kill them. And the defense is that was just sort of ironic, funny, finger-popping comedy. And so I think, you know, it's, it's incredibly problematic if you're going to sort of simultaneously complain that everything is speech to then turn around and as a defense say that nothing is in fact meaningful speech. Very interesting uh, description of how defining too much as speech may complicate the analysis and your notion that in Charlottesville the problem wasn't imminence but drawing the line between speech and conduct and the ACLU reached the same conclusion when it decided after Charlottesville to stop defending people who are carrying weapons as speakers because they actually had the intent to carry out the conduct. Floyd, you're going to be the final adjudicator on the imminence question, which was, of course, central to the Pentagon Papers case. You noted that now the speakers are global and can't know when speech is posted in one country what the effect will be in another. On the Internet, is the imminence test still relevant? And if not, what's your alternative? Well, it's relevant, uh, and I think it would be enforced um, as a generality. Uh, by the court, um, uh, I, uh, I've never been, I, I don't want to really sound too cynical about it, but I, I've, I've thought for some time that, that it's very important to have rather broadly written Supreme Court opinions. Um, and then when we get to some really hard case, we'll find a way. Uh, to deal with it. Uh, uh, there was a time in the 1970s when, and this comes back to something Fre Fred had said earlier, when commercial speech was discovered for the first time, First Amendment 
protected the prices of drugs in a drugstore at a pharmacy being advertised, the price of liquor in a liquor store being advertised. Uh, there were perfectly serious reasons not to allow it. Uh, too many people drink too much. It leads to problems. Uh, price wars about drugs can lead to drugs being uh, uh, filtered uh, down in a way uh, to, to allow you to sell it uh, cheaper. Uh, and the court bought in to the notion that nonetheless, uh, that was First Amendment protected. Indeed, Justice Blackmun, in a very important opinion, said for a lot of people, the price of drugs is more important than who they vote for for president. Uh, um, and people like me at that time were very worried uh, about Fred's point about the diminution and that if we start giving full protection to this and that and that and that, uh, we might wind up losing some great political speech case someday. What, what we all agree, the First Amendment is most and most obviously and most importantly about. But it didn't happen. Doesn't mean it can't happen. But it, it hasn't happened. We've expanded the, the, the topics of what's protected by the First Amendment uh, in, in ever more expansive language. Uh, and we wind up in political speech cases now citing some of the commercial speech cases because the language is so broadly written that, I mean, it's a perfectly appropriate citation. It just was not predictable necessarily uh, that, that that would happen. Uh, so it, it's very hard uh, to make these predictions about the, the impact of this in the future. But, but I would say very broadly that the the changes in our society and in the speech of our society wrought by new social media is so extraordinary, so, so massive uh, in nature that uh, while the courts have started out, but there haven't been that many cases, but started out very sympathetic to the development of new media and the protection of it, that it's, it's even harder to predict I think what's, what's going to happen down the road uh, in that area uh, where, where, where we're talking about uh, such, such enormous impact uh, on the public uh, so easily obtained uh, and, and the damage uh, are really quite predictable. Okay, I think this is the last round before questions, uh, so it's very important. Uh, and Nicole, Facebook is about to create a Supreme Court for Facebook, <coughs> and Google and the other tech companies are facing increasing pressures to engage in content moderation. If you were Chief Justice of the Facebook Supreme Court, and I wish you were, <laughs> if someone had to be Chief Justice, I would like it to be you, what substantive free speech standards would you apply? Would they be the standards of Abrams and Whitney and Brandenburg, that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence? Or would you prefer some other standard? And if you'd like, in this round, for all of you, you can pick your favorite quotation from Howard's wonderful selection or come up with your own First Amendment <laughs> standard to rival Holmes and Brandeis. Um, so I would not take that job, just to be super clear. <laughs> um, if uh, after you will not serve. I think, uh, so I think it's really interesting, this notion of a, a Facebook Supreme Court or, or any company's Supreme Court. And, and I take that because I think of it not in like what are the substantive laws, but like what is that process? What is that privatization of the, the, the adjudication <laughs> of content? Um, and I think it is more than, I don't know if this is heretical to say on Law Day, but like I think it is more than just our First Amendment because what you have to understand about Facebook and, and Google and YouTube and, and all of these global platforms is that their assessment of speech is a global question, not a First Amendment question. And so the, the, the Supreme Court, whatever it is, will not be measuring against First Amendment values, but global values, right? What is, what is the law in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, 
in Thailand where they do business, where they have employees on the ground, and what does it mean within the context of those countries to keep um, uh, expression up or, or take it down? And, and that, to me, is actually the challenge of our next um, move into, into free expression law, which is like, what does it mean for us globally to moderate speech, to manage speech? I, I don't think it is, for me, an eminence test. I think, to me, it is not so much trying to restrain speech. And I am hugely concerned about the laws popping up around the world, from everywhere from <coughs> Germany to Australia to, to uh, Russia and China, that look at pieces of content or types of content, terrorist content, hate speech, um, uh, pornography, and, and insist upon taking them down. And usually, the, the law in Germany right now is to take down um, some content within an hour. Uh, that is, a, I think, a, a ladder to the bottom. Um, and, and so rather than look at tests about like what content can we take down, I'd rather look at structures of how do we improve the entire ecosystem for better content mm. um, and, and, and better behavior of, of the people who speak. Such powerful points. When we talked in 2009 for that piece that's quoted in the booklet, you talked about the difficulty that you had in making decisions about what Thai law required. And you're reminding us now that a single Supreme Court for Facebook could never work. You might need separate courts or adjudicators for each country. And the ecosystem may be more important than the substantive standards. Justice Schauer, you are also choosing, I think, the standards for you know the Supreme yeah. Court of the Internet, because that frees us up to <laughs> abandon or use the American First Amendment tradition as we please. What is your test? So um, I want to pick up on what Nicole was saying about Germany and other places. It is interesting to me that a significant number of people who more or less share my political priors think that we ought to look to other developed industrialized democracies when we formulate our laws about sexual orientation, about the death penalty, and some number of others. Most people get off the bus when it turns to free speech. That is, the US is a protective outlier compared, uh, and I'm not talking about North Korea and Zimbabwe uh, and Saudi Arabia, a protective outlier compared even to the UK, uh, Germany, Switzerland, France, Norway, uh, New Zealand, pick your favorite nice country. <laughs> uh, um, and I think if I am the chief justice of the internet, I want to follow the lead of what some of the current justices of the Supreme Court have done uh, or want to do on issues of, as I said, sexual orientation, the death penalty, and so on, and look at what other places are doing. Uh, I want to be less provincial uh, and recognize that there are lots of thriving democracies with thriving free speech cultures that may not have gone quite as far as the US uh, and may take opposing values of reputation, of dignity, uh, reputation in the UK, um, dignity in Germany, privacy in France, perhaps a little bit more seriously when they uh, compete against free speech values. So yes, that's a non-answer to your question, <laughs> uh, but I want to look to the world. It's not a non-answer, and it's a good reminder that the world is indeed favoring values like dignity um, over uh, liberty. And uh, uh, Justice Lithwick, young people tend to do that too. And they are often on campus and online willing to put values like equality and dignity over the American free speech tradition. Do you, so in 30 years, the Supreme Court, once those young people are on it, may have a different balance. If you were Chief Justice of the Internet, uh, what would your standard be? And would it be closer to the standard of these young people and Fred Schauer or to the classic standard? You know, my, my concern, Jeff, and we haven't talked a ton about news, but we should talk about it for a minute because I think it's the, the sub-theme of this panel. And um, 
you know, I think one thing that is not working in efforts to uh, correct for bad news or untruthful news is the sort of fact check industrial complex, right? Where we have one guy who throws out Pinocchios two days later and that's meant to correct for something that has already been uh, broadly disseminated. And you can, you know, pick your example post Parkland when, you know, within a minute uh, uh, there were false stories about uh, uh, one of the victims. Uh, so I think that one of the things we have to think about, and, and I, I think of this only because you're asking me about young people, is that um, the really dispiriting conversations I have had with them in the last few years involve um, their claims that all news is fake and that the entire uh, project of journalism and the media uh, is uh, broken. And, and I can quote my own son, my 14-year-old son, who just says it's all fake. Uh, and that's how we solve for it. Now, there's an interesting way in which one way to do that is what we saw in Parkland, which is a workaround, right, where they take to their Twitter and to their Instagrams. We saw that in Charlottesville, by the way. The best coverage of Charlottesville was the kids with their Instagram coverage, which was actually far more truthful than a lot of what uh, the media uh, picked up in the first days. But I think that this path that we're on, and particularly that I hear from young people, which is, you know, every one of us is a journalist and all institutional journalism is broken and untrustworthy. It has its appeal for some of the reasons that, you know, I think generally the values there are tilting at, I think, more universal, international, humanitarian values. But I think we are watching the sort of slow, systematic erosion of confidence in journalism as a project. Mm. And I think that what we are giving up on is far more profoundly powerful than anything we can make up with the sort of daily me of Instagram. That is such a profound point. And without some consensus around facts and trust in the people who are supposed to be finding it, the whole system collapses. So thank you for that very pessimistic intervention. <laughs> Uh, 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 Justice Abrams, l last word to you. I'm you, weeping. You, uh, uh, you can uh, leave uh, us with a string in our step before the questions, or you can bring us down further. But if, uh, are you good, if you continue to embrace well, the I have a, imminent standard, or if you were Chief Justice of Facebook, you, would you uh, adopt another standard? I think I would, Im I would import the notion of federalism uh, into my role as Chief Justice uh, of Facebook. Uh, that, uh, yeah, the English can more or less, you know, have their system, we can have ours, et cetera. Um, um, and they're all in a, a ballpark, which is acceptable. I mean, I, I wouldn't presume to tell Germany with its history not to ban Nazi emblems or uh, uh, India with its history of communal violence, uh, uh, not to take some steps designed to prevent that violence that occurs when Muslims and Hindus uh, attack each other in particularly uh, harsh ways. Um, that said, I'd add a, a, a final note on, on this, and that, and that is I don't disapprove at all of social media having different rules, uh, more relaxed, if you will, uh, than we impose uh, under the First Amendment. Uh, I mean, most of what Facebook, to take one example, bans is protected by the First Amendment. I mean, we basically protect hate speech in America. We protect threats that are not true threats, but which Facebook, if confronted with it, would simply not, not allow. I mean, there are, there are lots of things that I think it's perfectly appropriate uh, for a social media entity to say, we choose not to have that uh, on, on our system, uh, uh, analogously, in a way, to a newspaper. So these, are, these are our standards. Now, they, you know, they won't be the loftiest standards all the time, but, but uh, I don't think we should confuse uh, the, the, uh, the degree to which we, we choose to protect First Amendment rights in a way 
the rest of the world thinks is a little bit batty uh, uh, in, in this country, uh, to be a system which we would even naturally seek to apply uh, to the Facebooks and Googles uh, and the like, even if we were advising them. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I mean, we, we should bear in mind, f final, final note, I promise, from me, there are other First Amendment theories than marketplace. Uh, uh, and we, we do have to be careful, I think, not to go too far down the road uh, of accepting a phrase uh, from a Supreme Court justice uh, as a, as a, a full-time articulation uh, of what our law is or should be. My First Amendment is an anti-sensorial First Amendment. My First Amendment is one which distrusts government in particular because we see what the world has done when governments have that power. I, I think that's what our Supreme Court has learned and, and our leaders at their best uh, have learned when they look around the world and look through world history uh, rather than uh, so some of the other uh, our, our articulations. Uh, you know, we, we can have our own judgment on that. All I'm saying is that we certainly ought not to equate uh, the, the level of First Amendment protection to what we ought to think even should be the level of what should be allowed or not allowed by these very powerful and very important but nonetheless private actors. Thank you for reminding us of the difference between public and private actors and for that resonant phrase, the anti-sensorial First Amendment. I am failing in my duties as moderator, and I've left only 10 minutes for questions. We are going to have to be, uh, end on time, so we have 10 minutes for your questions, which I will take now. Yes? Uh, is there a mic? If not, I will repeat the question. Speech is covered by various and sundry whistleblower protection acts, statutory, which is very faulty. <coughs> and then when you have a situation where reporters get credit for scoops, but they are and their freedom of write, writing the story, but those scoops are based on leaks from federal employees who could get prosecuted or God knows what could happen to them. I think there is a fundamental free speech problem. Thank you for that. The question is the free speech and First Amendment rights of federal employees and whistleblowers. Uh, uh, Floyd or Dahlia, who, who wants to take it? i just say that I, I, I agree with uh, that part, that rather small part, of an op-ed piece in the Times earlier this week which, which urged that there be a public interest defense for government employees who leak information, as there is in countries that are democratic and non-First Amendment. England allows someone who leaks information to justify it to a jury by saying it was so important and there was no other way to get it out uh, except by my coming forward. We don't. Uh, we, we need jury nullification uh, for that government employee to win that case. Thank you for that. Other questions? I'm uh, candidly deeply disturbed. I'm deeply disturbed by three of our panelists' seeming rejection of basic First Amendment values. So I, <laughs> I'd like to give them a chance to redeem themselves in at least one <laughs> listener's eyes by telling me if there are any of these just terribly outrageous decisions that, that Floyd Abrams points to uh, that they think should have been decided differently. In other words, okay, fine. Uh, you know, you don't like the algebra, uh, but I want to know if you get to a different result. And if so, what's your algebra? to get there. Thank you for throwing down the gauntlet on uh, Law Day. I'm standing here gazing at the Which waving they, flag oops, of Canada. Three. You're, you're <laughs> suggesting that our panelists are closer to its free speech tradition than the American one. So I, I think, uh, Nicole, I think you were one of the three. Which uh, First Amendment, which free speech decision do you disagree with? 
if any. I, I don't reject the First Amendment. I just think from, and I think I love what Floyd had to say, like from, so I'm just coming at it from the social media platforms position, right? Which is that they have the right to decide what's on their, their platforms. And the First Amendment is not necessarily always the right measure for what is appropriate on them. Right. I think there are some pretty decent arguments against Snyder versus Phelps, the Westboro Baptist Church uh, case. If we reframe that as, as the litigants did, uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress, um, I think there are places, there, there may be more room for that than current law allows. And I'll add one other uh, recent uh, and controversial case, United States versus Alvarez. Mr. Alvarez claimed to have won the Congressional Medal of Honor. He didn't. Uh, uh, he hadn't even served in the military um, um, when he was prosecuted under something called the Stolen Valor Act. Uh, his conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court. I think there is room, whether it be in a case like Alvarez or a case that's somewhat similar, room for perhaps a little bit more um, sensitivity to the harm of straight out verifiable factual falsehood, uh, as in Alvarez. I don't know who the good panelist is, but I'm going to say it's, it's me. Um, no, I, I think, uh, I, I actually think that uh, Snyder was correctly decided. I think that the pure speech cases that we've talked about today are largely correctly decided. And I think when the Roberts court sort of prides itself in the f pure speech context uh, on, on being the most protective, speech protective court, um, you know, in modern history, there's nothing wrong with that. My, my objection was to non-speech cases that have bled into First Amendment doctrine and the ways in which those cases become proxy wars for other values. So when you're defending speech that is, you know, religious speech and saying this is a pure speech case because you like the religious component of the speech, I think that's problematic. I guess if I had to pick a case, and maybe this is the proxy wars um, extension. I think Bong Hits for Jesus is a good example of a case that is a pure speech case, and it's a student speech case, but we don't like drugs, so it's wrongly decided. And my view is, let's litigate the speech claims. They're all horrible speakers, so let's agree they're horrible speakers. We protect them because we have a long, illustrious history of protecting horrible speakers, with which I have no quarrel. I have an immense quarrel with taking absolutely non-speech or speech-adjacent conduct, regulating that as a speech case because the underlying conduct is something that you approve of. Floyd, whether you're the good or bad panelist, you did criticize some of the decisions. If you had to pick a single decision I, I have that was wrong, in common you with, with these people. <laughs> I'm going to be the good one. Do you, or do you think, that, and of course, you think Citizens United was correct? Is there any free speech decision of the Roberts and Rehnquist court that you think was wrong? See, I, I usually wait till the end of the evening. Yes, to do uh, the Citizens before United before we get to Citizens United. <laughs> no, but, no, no, but you think that was right? So tell us what you think was wrong. Is there is there a free speech decision you think was wrong? Uh, I wasn't as concerned as you, Dahlia, about the student speech case, but only because uh, I hadn't thought it out, maybe, but we haven't historically given young people, high school students, the level of First Amendment protection. And, uh, you know, at least in general, uh, uh, it was a silly case. Mm -hmm. I mean, the students shouldn't have been punished. Uh, and the courts should have sent everybody home. You know? uh, uh, but, uh, but I don't, uh, what I, uh, I mean, the, the First Amendment team doesn't win all its cases, uh, by the way. Uh, 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 and, and that's true in recent years as well. But, but, but the two cases that Fred mentioned are illustrative. Of, of the extraordinary breadth of First Amendment protection. I mean, if, when we're starting a new society, no First Amendment, no Constitution, and the question was, what do you think about protecting this? You know, 
we're going to have people outside churches mocking the dead soldiers uh, 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 and saying that, that, that God did it on purpose because the country is too pro-gay. Uh, how, how about that one? <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and, and some of the other ones that, that we, we, we protect, animal cruelty, movies of uh, animal cruelty. Animal cruelty is illegal everywhere, federal and every state. But when you do a film of it to sell, at least in the case before the Supreme Court, uh, that was held protected speech. Uh, and and uh, you know, I, th I think as we close this part of the evening, uh, at least uh, we ought to be pleased that we do live uh, in this extraordinarily protective uh, society with, with respect to speech. Uh, thank you for that inspiring note on which <laughs> we can indeed end this panel and for casting so much light on the crucial question of the status of free speech in American democracy. Please join me in thanking our extraordinary panelists. So, once again, it it's truly becomes apparent when we sit in the audience why Jeffrey has been asked to do this on multiple occasions. Another great performance, and a great performance uh, and provocative thought from the panel. Thank you all again for doing this. We really appreciate it. Let's give him another round of applause. And... Uh, I want to thank our staff that have worked hard all year long to put this program together and our volunteers. Uh, you know how much we believe and think of you, so thank you again for what you do. Uh, audience members, thanks for participating. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing how important it is that we continue to have this discussion, how important it is that we continue to make sure that we have free speech, a free press, and free society. With that, happy Law Day. Enjoy the rest of your day thinking about the topics we talked about tonight. Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you.